the switch on good? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so today we're going to learn how to turn a basket weave illusion. You have a tool rest? You have a tool rest? Why isn't it always in there? It's always in there. I don't know. <laughs> Look at the box. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. That moment that you thought you were going to do it now. We have two of course we have two of That'll work. <laughs> Okay, what am I doing wrong now? Oh, that would be it. It spins. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start by shaping the bottom or the outside. Maple. It was labeled ambrosia, but there's no ambrosia in it. When you do, when you turn in the basket weave, it doesn't matter okay. what the wood is. The lighter the color of the wood, with the less grain pattern, the better. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So as I said, we're going to start by shaping the outside. Sorry, I don't usually talk when I'm turning. <laughs> I'm usually by myself. Yeah. The Where's it? There we are. Yeah, that's what I thought was going on. That's much better. This is a tough crowd, isn't it? Is there a specific shape? Whatever shape you want, as long as it's round.
I for it's a half inch bowl gouge. So I forgot to mention most of my turnings like this I start with a two and an eighth inch Forstner bit which fits good over the over the 50 millimeter jaws. No, you could turn end grain too. So when you're doing this, you want to make everything as smooth as possible because once you cut the beads, you're not going to be able to go back and sand, sand them down without flattening the beads out. This is just marking the recess because that's where I'm going to go when I flip the chuck around.
and I always just eyeball my dovetail and cut it with a skew. Just a wide negative rake scrape scraper. Yes, I did. I bought a piece of high-speed steel from China off of eBay, and I ground the uh, I ground the edge on it. Starting at a 150, and I'll just do a 220, and that'll be smooth enough. Yep, because next step is to be cut the beads, and once you cut the beads, you can't go back and sand it, or you'll end up sanding the, the tops of the beads flat. No. No. Alright, so for this I'm going to use two beading tools. I'm going to use a 3 8 which I'm going to use to cut the rim bead, and then the rest is going to be the eighth inch. So 
so when you're going to use this, you're not going to go in with the flute upwards. You're going to cut it with the flute aiming down on the tool rest. But the, the two ends of the flutes are what you're going to use to do Yes. You want that a lot, right? Huh? Battle up. Yeah, like, okay. like that. <clears throat> and what you got to do is, when you're on the tool rest, you got to yeah, rock, rock the bracket back and forth, which is going to form the bead. And did you make that tool? No, I bought these from D-Way. From where? D-Way. And you always want to stop just short of completely rounding the bead because if you try to round it completely, you'll end up tearing some of the, the bead off the top. Yep. All you're doing is you're putting the the one put the left point into the groove that the the previous bead cut. Yeah, once you once you get the tools, it's not it's not all that difficult to to do. It's time consuming. It's time consuming, but it's not all that difficult. No, when you're using these tools, you want to be a, a little bit above the center line. I mean the surface of the wood. Are you holding the tool? Because so, you're going down a curve. Now. No, I'm, calling, I'm holding it like that so that this is still raking down a little bit. I usually do between five and six hundred RPMs. That's like five fifty. It's on the dot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm left-handed, so I'm going to get in the way. 
Now I'm going to block everybody off. The curse of being left handed. Okay. So that's the outside. Okay. How do you how do you sharpen that tool? Carefully. You turn your wheel yeah, carefully. <laughs> you, you you turn your grinder on, let it get up to speed, turn it off, and as it's decelerating, just barely touch the touch the tool to the wheel. It doesn't take a lot to sharpen them. Is it carbide? No, high just high speed steel. Whatever whatever steel uh, D Way uses in his tools. D Way is a manufacturer. Yeah. Not necessarily a supplier. Ray took it. Whatever you're looking for. Okay. What are you looking for? Ask Jerry. My truck key. Oh, no, it's still in my bag. <laughs> so now we're going to flip it over. So when we turn the inside, we're not going to turn it all in one shot. We're going to split it into thirds. The reason we do that is because if you turn it all in one shot and then you try to turn the beads, you're going to get vibrations. So you want to leave some meat in the center so that you won't get those vibrations as you turn it, as you turn the beads.
And I'll just pull up my trusty finger calipers to check the, the thickness. Okay.
that's basically all you do is you just do a little bit of continue down. Go go back and sand again. Curse of the left hand. Now, if you were turning something bigger, you would want to do more than thirds. I think that big one, I did it in sixth.
So you guys are getting the twofer because you learn how to turn the platter too. <laughs> if you take out one of those beads, you can take part of it back. I think if you were, if you took out one of those beads, you would probably have to cut them all off and then start from start from the beginning to make them all even an even height. Almost got the sand. Well, that's part of it. I right. pass it around while I get set up for the next part. Of course there's going to be dust on it, I just sanded it. <laughs> well, the next step is to mark off all the individual lines if you want to pass that around. Yeah, that's on that. can mark off the lines on the lathe. <clears throat> to do that, you put a piece of plywood maybe about that wide and you can either use the indexing if your lathe has really fine indexing on it or you can sandwich one of these in between the chalk. How 
and use that as, a, as an indexer. So when I started, I did it on the lathe by marking the lines. So I had one of these and I had a second one that I would line up with that wheel on the side. And I used a little spring clamp to clip it, advance it, clip it, advance it. So this, the top of this would be with the center of the spindle. So that would give me my indexing. Then after a while I realized how long it was taking to mark the lines and then go back and burn the lines. So I came up with this. Which I didn't come up with the, the idea. But you have to burn the circular lines around also. Oh yeah. Thanks for reminding me. you do that on the jig? No, I need that back. <laughs> So you do that with a piece of Formica. Where's the one that I did? I just turned. It's a piece of Formica from a countertop. You don't want to use a credit card because a credit a credit card will just burn the plastic into the grooves. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> You can also do it with a pencil. I mean, it, it, some of them, it, it, this one, I did, I did do after the fact with a mechanical pencil, because the mechanical pencil's got the same size lid all, all the way through, so you don't have to worry about it dulling. And it fits in that groove, so you can go draw your circles and just mark off. All you're doing is you're making it, it, the insides a little darker, so they stand out. Yeah, you would use a, uh, you would want to use something no more than satin. Because remember, you're, you're, this whole process is mimicking a basket weave, like a Native American basket weave, and none of them are glossy. So basically all this doing is it's building up heat and it's, it's burning in between each bead. I did try a credit card, and all I ended up doing was making blue lines in between in between the beads. Yeah, you just you're darkening the lines in between the beads so that they stand out a little bit.
on the, the top, the ones in the center, you really don't have to worry too much about darkening them because when you burn your lines, the lines get so close together in the center, I always end up just coloring the, at least the first like six circles a solid color. If you want to pass that around, that's a piece of a Formica. It's actually the end cap off of a off of a, a, a countertop kit. The color doesn't matter. It's just nope. You just want the Formica because it doesn't melt into the wood. It just the friction causes the wood to. Uh, mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Okay, so next we're going to burn the lines. <clears throat> it's a lot of different manufacturers of uh, wood burning pens. I use a razor tip. You really don't want to use one of the ones that look like a soldering iron because you can't get the fine enough tips to do this. So you won't be able to see it, but I marked off one line so I know where I start. You have, you have one of these already on there? Yeah, this is 152 lines. Oh, okay. That's, that's 200. Okay. And the key, the, the, the important part with making your lines is you want to make sure they're at least divisible by four. So you get equal, equal pattern all the way around. Okay. That's what I do. I do divisible by four. That way I can take which will be for the next, but you want to pass this around. This is how I design my patterns. Okay. you just download those templates from somewhere? Uh, polar, uh, it, uh, let's pass this around because I did print some of these out with all the information on it. Oh, okay. uh, Graph Paper Maker is the name of the program. It's a free program to try. It embosses their information on it, yeah, okay. which if you can live with that, it's free. If you don't want that on your, on your graph paper, you, I think it's like 10 bucks for the program. So basically what we're gonna do is we're just going to slowly skate across Mark the front. 
you want it hot enough so that it's going to darken, but you don't want to burn the wood or make it too dark. No, and the tip that I'm using, it's, they call it a knife tip, so it's really fine, so it actually, it's, it cuts into the wood really easy, so it makes nice indentations in the wood. Yes, I do. I'm not doing that tonight. <laughs> I'll do a couple lines and then that'll be good for this. <laughs> so, do you just advance it? So, you don't have to stop on that. You're doing that by line. Yes. Which is okay because you're, you're mimicking a, a basket weave. I don't think I've ever seen an image of a basket weave where everything was perfectly uniform. So imperfections aren't a bad thing. So a nine, a nine inch plate like this will usually take me about an hour hour and a half to, to burn all the lines in. And when you're doing this, you always want to start from the center. Because then, if you start from the outside, especially on the, on the front where everything's got to come to a point, sometimes the knife will find a, find a groove and follow it, and it might follow it down or up, and you won't get straight lines. So that's basically how you burn in the lines. Because you want to keep the front and the back equal as possible so that when you do the coloring, you kind of line up. You can't do it. You can't do, you can't do it if you go all the way across because you won't be able to get everything perfectly, perfectly straight. And it covers the front and the back. Right? Yeah, it it comes off. So it, I, it, this part will, I can take off. So if I use it for different things, like it, yeah. I use this curve for stuff like that, where I'm going to go on the outside of a vessel. So now, where do you keep the vodka while you're doing all this? Where I keep the what? The vodka. <laughs> I don't drink vodka. I drink beer. <laughs> it's in this. It's usually sitting right. It's sitting in a. It's usually sitting in a big cup right next to me. <laughs> so the next process is to get your lines marked on the rim. There's a couple ways to do it. You go this way where you're just going from one side to the other. <clears throat> you go this way where you're dividing it in half and you're coming to a point. Or... Here, we'll put... Yeah, we could do that. So... You got it? So this one, I just meet, I burned a center line 
okay. And then both of these are coming to, uh, to a point, going in one direction. This is the easiest to do. So this one, it's just a line that's going from one side to the other side and you're just making sections. This is a little more complicated, not much once you learn the process, but it makes it look like it's actually woven in. Mm -hmm. It looks like, it, it, like the two parts actually inter intersect and cross over each other. And that's what you would you would see in a true ba like you, woven basket. You're doing this on no like the same setup. No, I do that freehand. Oh, this is freehand. Okay. Okay, that's what I want. All right. So to do it, to do that pattern, you're gonna start. by making your center line. Okay. And then essentially it's just I'm going to start one line. Take it just a hair bit past center. Mm -hmm. Then come over here. Take another line just a hair bit past center. And then you're just going to repeat that. Are you ultimately going to burn those? Yes. By okay. hand? Yes. There's a lot of that. Huh? No, I'm yelling at Ray. So you just you're so you're just repeating that pattern all the way around, and if you if you did it right, it'll match up at the once once you get all the way around. So do you draw it all the way back Then you burn it into it. Yes, and the one that's. The one that's not painted that was being passed around, it's got it where I drew it all the way around. How long does it take you to burn it after that? Uh, I've never timed myself. Maybe half, maybe half an hour to an hour to, to burn that, that rim in. At that point, it's just you're following the lines. Either that or a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> so the next step is the coloring. Uh, I need the one that's got the, all the lines burned in it. No, no, there's one that's floating around that's got. No, not the colored in one. Yep, that would be the one. <laughs> and then I need the uh, yeah my gra my graph pattern that I have the circular one. No, uh, well, there it is. Okay, so uh, to design your pattern, you would uh, count your rings and then remember how many lines you burn into it 
and then you go to a graph paper maker and download the program and you can print out polar and regular graph paper. So the regular graph paper I would use for that vessel and this vessel, anything that's a vessel. The polar paper is for bowls, plates, anything that's a circle and flat. This way you can design your pattern and see what works and what looks nice before you start coloring in. Because with the Indian ink pens, once you color them in, you're not completely done. If you make a mistake and you catch it right away, you can take an X-Acto knife and you can quickly scrape it off. If the ink sits for too long, it will soak into the paper, into the wood, and then you're going to be scraping forever to, to make it go away. I've made plenty of mistakes, so don't be worried about that. So we're going to do this pattern. You got me? No, I designed it myself. I may do a little research on Google and I look up Native American weave woven baskets and look at stuff and get ideas and stuff from them. So. These are Indian ink pen markers, so they're permanent, light fast. These are Fabric Hassle. Mm -hmm. There's a couple different manufacturers, like this is Pigma, which is a similar archival ink. And I picked up these black pigment pens off of Amazon. They're the same thing. They're just, you want to make sure it's a, an archival ink, something that w won't bleed with water and will fade with light. So to color it in, I'm going to do the outside ring. You losing me? This is a fat brush. Okay. I bought these on a whim by mistake, thinking that because I was like, oh, they got more ink in them. I'm not thinking that the brush tip was going to be bigger than. than the, the brush tips that I was using. You got it? Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. But they come in handy when you when you need to fill in a large a large area. And this is the tedious part. This is the part. <laughs> he thinks this is tedious. I don't know. I feel like that. Can you turn it around a bit so we can see? Better? So you would do that and then So I'm curious, how do you keep your face in the pattern? Huh? So you've drawn your pattern on the graph paper. Yep. And I know the graph paper corresponds to the segments on the whole. But how do you keep yourself from getting lost in the pattern? Count count numbers. So then you, you so once you once you get the the bulk of it colored in, then you switch over to a finer pen to get down 
into the recess. And there I messed up. Dark color, like red or something. Did you put a drop of white on it and put red over it? No. But what you can do is, I got black lines that go all the way through. I could just make that my starting point. The man has made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. That's how he knows how to correct. I won't bore any, everybody with going and trying to uh, get all the way into the grooves. Chris, do you overlay the, for example, the Native American pattern on this plate that you know, Pete has? Do you overlay that or do you, that's all freehanded? That's all freehanded. So would you just get as close to, to the lines as you feel comfortable and then you go back in with the finer pens. What's the final finish? Uh, you don't want to do something glossy. You want something that's pretty flat. So I wouldn't go with anything over a satin with it but I a lot of guys will use like a just a rattle can matte finish that Krylon that Krylon sells spray yeah it's a spray can better Now, the fine one that you put into grooves is what makes it look finished, nice, straight edge on it. Which? No, it was that, when, you, when I looked at that, it looked like it was... Yeah. Oh, because I didn't go back and worry about color and then the, the edges, but you can use... Here, we could pass around. There's a small brush tip. Those are mainly the two that I uh, that I use. I have a question about your setup at home. Obviously, you're sitting and coloring for hours. So, do you sit at a bench at a table? Do you do this in your lap? No, I sit. I sit at my comfy chair with the TV blaring because I got ADD. So. <laughs> To give give me background. So now to do this, now that I got that those lines established, I'm going to count over four, and we'll we'll go through the center. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm going to go eight lines over. Oh, no, don't worry. I'm normally not doing this standing up. <laughs> and then, so our pattern is going to be uh, four over, three down, two back, and one up.
And that gives us our starting pattern. And you're just going to repeat those patterns all down that line until you get to the, the inside. So I won't bore anybody with watching me <laughs> color in the dots. <laughs> Any questions? Or? If you want, I'm more than happy to uh, to give you a one-on-one. Listen, -on -one. Gary's going to invent something where you stick it in there one time, all those lines are coming. CNC machine. There you go. That's great. That's great. Yeah, CNC would be cheap. It wouldn't be handmade anymore. <laughs> <laughs>